It is time for us to get started. I want to welcome you again to our monthly FYI Naturalist uh, program, uh, Find Your Inner Naturalist program. We're so glad that you could join us this evening. This virtual program is made possible because of the strong partnership between Warner Park Nature Center, a Metro Parks facility, by the way, Friends of Warner Parks, and our fantastic Nature Center staff. We have to do this, okay? Oh, oh, we have to pause. Tara just shared that she's enjoyed the cross-country course the last couple of weekends, but there's lots of butterfly activity in the field. Don't know if they've all been monarchs, and that's why she's here to learn. So back to the Zoom rules. We have to do this. During the webinar, you will be able to see and hear Rebecca and me at times and what we are sharing on our screens, but we can't see you. So if you have a question or a comment, please use the chat or Q&A features found at the bottom of your screen. I will be monitoring the chat throughout the entire presentation, and I'm also going to be adding some information, such as terms that Rebecca uses to describe butterflies, maybe some websites. So kind of keep your right eyeball on that chat. And if you have questions, please go ahead and put those in the chat. If for some reason you're kicked off of the webinar or it suddenly closes, don't panic. Simply close out of Zoom and reconnect with the link that you received uh, throughout uh, in your confirmation email. Remember I told you to save that. If you're unable to see or hear the presentation or have any other difficulties, you can communicate that through the chat or through Q&A. And our tech support, who is Rachel Anderson, thank you for being on here tonight, Rachel, um, will assist you. And you can also call the Nature Center at 615-862-8555. Now, before you get started, Rebecca, we did have another um, monarch experience. It wasn't a monarch butterfly, but I had monarch caterpillars eat my common milkweed that I planted <sighs> earlier this year. And um, I do want everyone to know that this presentation is being recorded, and we will send out a link to the recording to everyone who has signed up. So even if you're not able to be here for the entire time, you can get a link to the um, presentation. It's gonna last about 40 minutes and we're gonna pause throughout the presentation to answer questions. So be sure to post your questions and answers in the chat. And now I'd like to introduce Rebecca Dandeker, a Warner Park Nature Center naturalist who will share her knowledge of monarchs, Warner Park Nature Center's Monarch Citizen Science Projects and how you can support this fascinating living organism. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you, Heather, and thank you, everyone, for sharing your monarch stories. Um, as Heather mentioned, my name is Rebecca Dandeker, and I'm a naturalist at the Warner Park Nature Center, and I am a butterfly enthusiast. It truly is my pleasure to discuss monarchs, as well as our citizen science efforts here at the park. Today, we're going to be focusing on building your toolkit to become a monarch citizen scientist. Interwoven throughout our discussion, we will cover monarch biology. You'll build instar identification skills and practice monitoring protocols. Near the end of our discussion, I'll share our monarch larva monitoring project data from our first two years and close with ideas how you can help monarchs. So why study monarchs? Monarchs are demure yet majestic living organisms that are nearly magical in what they can accomplish. They capture our attention with our iconic black and orange pattern and their graceful flight. They remind me of simpler times when they were abundant in the fields near my childhood home. And above all, they inspire curiosity. Perhaps the greatest reason to study monarchs is that they truly need our help. David Wolf of the Environment Defense Fund, or Defend Fund, shared this statement in 2016. The iconic and beloved North American monarch butterfly is one of the species that has difficulties adjusting to our new climate-stressed world. Its population has declined 95% in the last 20 years. In the years leading up to this quotation, 
the estimated overwintering population of butterflies was actually less than 60 million for three years in a row. Now this number may seem really large. However, in 1996, the population actually peaked at over 910 million butterflies. So you can see why people were concerned when we hit below this, the 60 million mark. Numerous groups have heard the call to act. And within the last five to six years, conservation efforts and citizen science opportunities have swelled to monitor, understand, and educate researchers as well as citizen scientists on population dynamics. Groups that you see on your screen right now rely heavily on the efforts of citizen scientists. Based on data from the World Wildlife Fund Mexico, the monarch population has rebounded some in the last few years, but remains very low. In 2019, the pop population was estimated at only 100 and 150 million butterflies below the extinction level. Later this year, it'll be decided if monarchs require federal protection. Today, much remains unknown, but what has been learned is that population dynamics are complex. There is not one sole reason for the population decline. Monarchs at all points along their life cycle are facing substantial challenges, including, but not limited to, adverse weather, loss of breeding habitat, loss of nectar sources, especially during the fall migration, and deforestation of overwintering sites. Hmm, so let's talk monarch biology. Monarch, bi monarch butterflies breed over a large ge geographical range, as shown here on this slide, that spans the U.S. into southern Canada. The monarch's inability to survive freezing temperatures at all stages of its life cycle necessitates its famous migration pattern, starting down here in Mexico and traveling and breeding as the weather warms into the north for four to five successive generations, then returning south as the temperatures seasonally decline. Most butterflies overwinter in Mexico, but some overwinter in Florida or the coast of California. It is helpful to understand that monarchs have both a life cycle and an annual cycle. As shown here on the left, the life cycle includes the typical four stages of development, egg, larva, chrysalis or pupa, and then adult. The monarch annual cycle is seasonal, starting with spring migration, followed by breeding, then fall migration, and then wintering in Mexico. It takes four to five life cycles to complete one annual cycle. Both cycles start in late February, March as the overwintering adults depart Mexico, sexually mature and begin breeding in the Southern US. When suitable larvae habitat is found, overwintered females lay eggs of the first generation of the year. Females lay between 300 to 400 eggs solely on plants within the milkweed family. The eggs are typically deposited singly, not in clusters, on the underside of the leaves, but may also be present above. Little is known why or how females choose their egg sites. Look for the eggs on the milkweed here on the right side of the slide. They're smaller in real life than in your image. Eggs are the size of a pinhead with distinct markings visible with a hand lens. So let's take the opportunity to look a little closer. Please look at the egg on your right. What colors, textures, and or patterns do you notice? Please list your observations in the chat. 
Okay, guys, so what do you see? List any observations about colors, textures, or patterns in the chat. Tara said it looks almost pearly. Jennifer also says it looks like a pearl. So some great observations. Really nice. So yeah, definitely has that translucent pearl type color, doesn't it? Does anybody else notice the ridges that run up and down? And notice also that the egg comes to a slight point. You may also notice there are some small little ribs on the inner side between the ridges. So these eggs definitely are very noticeable and distinct if you have a hand lens. Believe it or not, but in three to eight days, that egg, from that egg emerges a monarch larva. And it has one goal in life at this point, and that is to eat. Another question for you, what colors, textures, unique features do you notice of the monarch larva? And please share them in the chat. Okay guys, you've got something new to look at. Y'all made some great observations last time. What do you notice about this? Uh, Rachel says black little spiky things coming off the body. Tara is sharing again, are those four little legs? Those little knobby things? Got a few more coming in. Black head with a hairy body from Jane. Black head and spikes. I also see polka dots forming. And they notice it's the same color as the egg. Back to you, Rebecca. Thank you. Wonderful observations. You guys, you guys would make some really good naturalists. Uh, definitely grayish white and it. The color looks a lot like the egg. It almost has that translucent, um, uh, almost, um, it's not really a texture, but more almost like a substance of the skin itself. Um, somebody noticed the least little nubs. I'm assuming this is what you were thinking about, these little guys right here. There's two in the front and two in the back. These actually are the nubs for the tentacles. Um, which we'll see a little bit later in larger caterpillars. And definitely, this guy looks very spiky. So, and a very black head. A little unusual. You may not be able to recognize this if you didn't know that it was actually a monarch larva. Very cool. One thing is that it has absolutely no stripes. Go ahead and continue to move forward. Now in this slide, you'll see something which looks a little bit more familiar with what a monarch larvae traditionally looks like. But remember that the larvae have one goal and that is to eat. Its body mass will increase over 2,000 times. That small little caterpillar that you saw on the last slide in the within nine to 15 days, depending on temperature, food quality, and food availability. There are actually five stages of larva development known as instars. In larva de development, the stripes, the characteristic stripes, only happen after consuming milkweed. Question for you, can you see the tiny monarch larva in this image? I'll give you just a few moments to look closely at your screen and see if you can find that very early caterpillar. Okay, I'm gonna start to draw your attention over to this side of the screen and I'm gonna narrow in on it right there. Hopefully you guys all see that very first instar the really small caterpillar, and you can see the drastic change it's going to make over its life. So for monarch larvae, it really is all about the food. Milkweed is critical to their survival. Adults have the ability to seek substance from multiple nectar sources, but larvae do not. Monarch larvae are specialist herbivores. They consume only plants in the milkweed family. Quick poll for you. Do you currently grow milkweed? And if so, what type? Notice that there are two questions on your poll.
Go ahead and answer the poll. Oh my goodness. Oh, Rebecca, you are, you are just gonna love these responses. I'm gonna go ahead right now. I'm gonna end the polling. I have, um, I have 25% of our group does grow milkweed, 75% does not. And of that 25%, uh, they grow common milkweed. Oh, fabulous, fabulous. 20, 25% is a really high number. That is wonderful. Okay, let's learn a little bit more about that common milkweed that 25% of you have planted. Okay, but before I do that, let's quickly mention that monarchs feed on 27 different species of native milkweed. The bad news for monarchs, as well as milkweed, is that milkweed, once prolific, is also experiencing a decline, especially on the Midwestern prairie. Milkweed loss and milkweed habitat defragmentation due to agricultural practices plus urban sprawl has applied significant stress on today's monarch population. Patches of milkweed are fewer and further between. In Nashville, the most important host plant, here you go, is the common milkweed. It is quite prolific in areas where milkweed is allowed to grow, but not all are created equal. Tropical milkweed, which you often see in some stores, can produce high levels of toxic steroids, carnalides, especially in warm conditions or climates such as Nashville. Let's just say these carnalides can ne negatively affect larva survival, at least in those con high concentrations. However, intermediate levels of carnelides found in native milkweed species provide an accessible and effective chemical defense. Monarchs sequenture these toxins, rendering them poisonous to some, but not all of their predators. Their warning coloration, prominently displayed on these two beautiful larvae, advertise their bitter taste and toxicity. Regardless of their chemical defense and warning coloration, larvae mortality might be higher than you think. Okay, here's a little share moment from my personal side. From a very young age, I actually believed monarchs were poisonous to everything and everyone. Not sure, but perhaps I tried to eat one as a toddler. Who knows? So back to you. What do you think the mortality rate of monarch larva is? And there should be a poll. Oh goodness. So we have a couple of responses. 25% um, of mm -hmm. our group agree with 25% as the mortality rate. 50% of our group agrees with 75%. Oh wait, people are changing. The numbers are changing. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, we're almost kind of even across the board, but 33% of our group says it's greater than 90% the mortality rate of a monarch larva. There you mm. go. Sounds like we have some people who are familiar with monarchs. So several studies actually have shown that the mortality rate of monarch eggs and larvae is over 90%. Why so high? Well, monarchs are killed for a variety of reasons, including predation by natural enemies, such as ants, spiders, stink bugs, beetles, lacewing larvae, red spider mites, you get the picture. There are also parasitoid flies and wasps that often use the larvae as hosts. Hmm, they can also become diseased, attacked by bacteria and viruses. Interaction with their host plant and its sticky toxic sap is another reason. Plus, there are abiotic factors such as adverse weather as well as exposure to pesticides. So there certainly are a lot of variables 
that impact the mortality rate of these monarch eggs and larvae. So take a look at this guy over here on the left side of your screen. Is this larvae dead? Well, no, it actually is not. It's preparing for the transformation into adult. Prior to pupating, a fifth instar, which is the largest of the caterpillars in the larva development, stops eating and goes on a walkabout. It is not surprising for them to travel 20 feet or more in search of the perfect lo location to convert into a pupa. Securely attached with a web-like substance, the larva hangs down in the shape of a J, where it molts for the very last time as a larva. This truly is fascinating to witness. The skin actually splits right behind the head, and then the body starts to wiggle and sways pushing the shed skin upwards all the way up towards the connection point. The pupa will darken to a true green, the perfect camoufla camouflage for its green world. As a pupa, the monarch will appear inactive for approximately 10 days before internal changes start to become visible. This particular specimen elected to pupate on our construction orange fence, as you can see down here in this little small picture, outside our bird research center in 2019. In the final 24 hours of the transformation, the lower half of the pupa will darken, the outermost layer will become translucent, and then nearly transparent. Take a moment. What do you notice here? Can you see elements of the adult form? Please go ahead and write your observations in the chat. We've got a couple of things that people are noticing. Nancy says it's hanging lower. Jennifer says it's darker in color. Rachel shared she can actually see the wing. Ah, very cool. So a few places I'd like to draw your attention to. You'll notice this section right down through here. This actually is where the wings are located. This section up here is where the abdomen is located. And then as it bursts, which you'll see in just a moment how the monarch looks when it comes out. All right. So this is the first stage of an adult monarch. Once the pupa is fully developed, the adults emerge or close, and then the pupa casing actually splits and the new adult climbs out head first. Often swaying from side to side, it transfers fluid from its abdomen, which is extended into its wing. And if you're waiting for this to happen, if you're watching a pupa out in a garden or maybe out in your yard, it typically occurs in the early morning hours. Within one hour from emerging, the wings will straighten and reach their full size. Wings, however, will take several hours to dry before the adult may fly in nectar. First, second, and third generation adults will travel north, breed, and restart the cycle of life. Breeding adults live between two and five weeks. Recall the monarch life cycle and the annual cycle. And remember, it takes four to five cycles to complete one annual cycle. The first generation normally emerge in May, the second in June, the third in July, and the fourth in August. However, the last generation is unique from the others. Due to environmental cues as a larva, such as progressively larger day and night temperature differentials, shorter day lengths, as well as increased milkweed age, the adults emerge from the pupa stage sexually immature or in reproductive diapause. It is these adults that make the famous fall migration all the way down to Mexico. Beginning 
Beginning in late August and continuing through late October, the northernmost fourth generation up in this region reverses direction and starts to travel the 2,000 plus miles to Mexico or to the mountains in central Mexico. Many aspects of their migration remain unclear. Monarchs do use air currents and thermals to conserve energy, visit stopover sites to nectar and roost in groups in the evening and or near unfavorable weather conditions. On average, their journey takes between 80 to 100 days and their survival during the migration is highly dependent on weather conditions, the availability of nectar sources, as well as individual aspects like their muscle strength and their ability to orientate to their wintering sites. Done now with the annual cycle, let's return back to the monarch life cycle. And I've shown it with a little bit more detail here, drawing your attention to larva development. Instar identification is an important part of most monitoring programs. Due to their expanding body size, larva molt five times. Each period between a molt is called an instar. Tentacle length, skin texture, relative head to body ratios, and feeding behavior provide identification clues. Size, however, is not a reliable field marking to use when you attempt to identify which stage of larvae development your instar is in. Let's take a look at the first two instars. Okay. Remember, size is not an accurate field marking to you to determine instar stage. Focus on colors and relative tentacle size. Looking over here on this side is your first instar. Please compare that to your second instar and share your comparison or contrast in the chat. Okay, Nancy has shared that second instar is much greener and has antenna. Jennifer says they look completely different. Tara <laughs> says it has become more yellow with the little points sticking up. No color to colorful is Jackie's observation. Oh, you guys got this. You guys got this. So the first instar, let's take a quick look at this. So this is what the instar looks like when it first emerges. You guys have seen this slide already. And as it starts to consume the milkweed, it will go ahead and develop some black striping. What's interesting about this stage is that a lot of times when you're looking at the leaf, you actually won't see the larvae. You'll see this trench light circle feeding behavior. And then you might see just a little bit of a, a guy after you draw your attention to this circle. There are other examples like right here and right here. The first instar, however, has no yellow. And I know several of you mentioned that. The other thing that the second instar has that the first instar does not are these tentacles. These tentacles are just starting to elongate, but they're still relatively short. There's a pair in the front as well as a pair in the back. Okay, let's go ahead and take a look at the next set of instars. So in one to three days, the second instar molts again, and then it will turn into a third instar. Please compare and contrast and leave your information in the chat. Okay, y'all had some great observations before. Nancy says the third instar has white stripes. Any other observations? Rachel says this one is a little more challenging. Oh, and that it is, that it well, is. They're taking off now. Jennifer says longer tentacles. Jackie says the third instar looks brighter. Jane says the tentacles are longer, the color is more muted. And Hansted says longer antennae. Lots mm -hmm. of 
Well, you guys got the number one way, the number one field marking to tell the difference between a second and a third instar. And it all has to do at this stage with tentacle length. So I want to draw your attention to the tentacles on the third instar. The front tentacles, if you were to fold them down, they would just reach the top of its head. And the back is just, they're present, but not super long. Another comparison I want you to look at is the tentacles here on the back side of the third instar and compare it to the front of the second instar. They actually look very similar, don't they? So one way you can tell the difference between these guys is by looking at the back tentacles. The back tentacles should be the same size as the previous instar. And if you look at the second instar, the back tentacles over here are very small, a little bit larger than nubs, but not too much. So that is reminiscent of the first instar. Definitely you'll start to see the pattern take shape. And the third instar has a slightly different feeding pattern. No longer does the circles and the trenching behavior, though it can, but it also will feed along the side of the leaves, making shallow circles or shallow edging. Okay, let's look at another one. Okay, I'm gonna keep my mouth shut, and, uh, but I am gonna ask the question, are these instars different and why? Okay, so Rachel shares that it has super duper long tentacles on the one on the left. Hanstead says longer tentacles, the one on the left. Uh, Jennifer says the tentacles on the right look shorter and is one fatter than the other one, <laughs> Nancy asks. And again, with the tentacles. Yeah, so great observations, everyone. The tentacles still continue to be the primary field marking to determine these instars from each other. This one over here on the left is a fourth instar. You notice that, that the tentacles are longer and they do extend past the head. At that point, you generally have a fourth instar. Please note the rear tentacles look a lot like the same size of the third instar tentacles in the front. Okay, so if we were to fold those down, it would just reach the edge of its body. Definitely on, this, on the fatness of the caterpillars, from the third to the fourth, you will see a significant increase in the width of its body. And a lot of people can tell fourth instars just by the ratio of the width of the body to the width of their head. On the third instars, the body width is about the same as the head, but here in the fourth, it's definitely a little bit larger on the body. Okay. So moving to the next one, this one it starts to get a little bit more complicated. Go ahead and compare and contrast these two sets of instars. Okay, waiting for some responses, but I bet they'll come in soon. Rebecca, these are great pictures that you've taken. This is, this is incredible. It is hard to take these guys. They never want to sit still. Okay, now They're here always they come. Tara is saying, are the ones on the left already starting to form the J? Jennifer ah. said both sets are very similar. Uh, Hanstead shares that the length is different. Mm -hmm. So the difference between the fourth and the fifth can be very difficult to tell. You can no longer rely on just the tentacle length to be able to determine the difference. There are minute differences that may be difficult to see on your screen. And the first one is the texture of the skin. The texture on the fifth instars is nearly velvety. 
whereas the skin is a little bit smoother on the fourth instars. On the fifth instars, you'll also notice that the black lines start to widen, so the pattern changes just a little bit. And if you were to take the ratio of the head to the body, you would notice that the head would be would appear smaller. Okay. Now these guys over here are both fourth instars, but it does show the size difference between the two of them. Fourth instars can range anywhere from about, mm, about one inch up to almost two. Okay. So this is the most difficult um, two stages to tell apart. Um, so look at your tentacle length, but also look at the texture of the skin, as well as the ratio of the body size to the head. And also in some cases, there's a long, longer difference or space between the true legs and what these are called the pro legs right here. So I feel like you've gotten a really good primer on instar identification. You guys have made some really nice observations and you'll have a chance to practice those skills in just a little further on in the presentation. Instar identification, as I mentioned before, is critical in most monarch larva, larva monitoring programs. The objective of monarch larva monitoring is to obtain an accurate count of monarch eggs and each larva instar within a registered site by examining, sorry, registered site by examining a recorded but unbiased sampling of milkweed plants on a weekly schedule. Participants monitor a particular site, often their own backyards, following a standard protocol. Needs for doing monarch larva monitoring are relatively simple. You require a hand lens, a clipboard, a thermometer, pen, and paper. The Warner Park Nature Center follows the monitoring protocol set forth by the Monarch Larva Monitoring Project. This is a leading research program that has been compiling and analyzing monarch population data since, since the 1990s. The MLMP is a collaborative effort between two powerhouses of conservation, partnering, and citizen science, the Monarch Joint Venture and the University of Wisconsin-Madison Arboretum. Protocols that they laid out have inclu or include that we report event details, including weather and site disturbances, that we use randomized plant sampling within the site or along a transect to avoid data bias. Protocols also include that we should conduct a thorough review of the entire plant. And for each plant, log abundance, absence is just as important as presence of eggs for each larval instar and or pupae, alive and dead. The procedure is easy. You approach one plant at a time, scan so that you do not disturb any larva or hanging pupae. Look closely, looking bottom up or top down systematically, searching each leaf, stem section, and any small crevices for eggs and larvae. Confirm egg sightings with hand lens, record each instar stage is found, circling data collected for each plant. Maintain a running tally of search plants with zero monarch present, and then repeat for the next plant. For small sites, attempt to random sampling between 50 to 70% of the milkweed population within the area. For larger sites, randomly select plants at spaced intervals. For example, perhaps every fourth plant that you see, or another method would be one every 10 feet depending on your site size. So, enough of the instructions. Let's go ahead and let's pretend that we are in um, a field and we are going to go check out this plant and do some monarch larva monitoring. We come up to this plant and the first thing that we notice down here, over on the right side of your screen, is a very small, what looks like a little dot. 
maybe the size of a pinhead or a pencil tip. Go ahead and pull out your hand lens and confirm that it is indeed a monarch egg. Okay. After you continue to look down the plant, on the, one of the lower leaves, you see this guy hanging out. So if this happens, we find this one egg as well as this one instar, the way to report this would be E, which stands for egg, comma, and then the number of the instar that you see. For example, you'll notice the tenai actually, or tentacles, extend past the head, so it's an instar number four. So then I would circle both the E and the four to symbolize that I found both of these larvae on one plant. Okay, hopefully that was clear. Let's try another example. But this time, I'm gonna let you do it. After searching this entire plant, you only see one instar, and it's the one that you see on your screen. You thought you might see eggs, but on closer inspection, white spots were just debris. How would you record this entry? You can answer this in the chat. From Tara, we have a five with a circle around it. Jace, yes. a four with a circle. Uh, Nancy, an E comma one. Rachel says four with a circle. Nice, nice. So I imagine you guys are looking at the tentacle size and it definitely does extend past the tip of the head. Now, be, I'm at a slightly, at a slight advantage here because I've actually, I actually took this photo. So I know what the texture of the skin was and it was indeed a uh, instar number four or a fourth instar. So, but you guys were all right on, okay? Go ahead and you do the four and then you draw the circle. Let's go ahead and try one more. This one gets a little bit more interesting. So after searching the entire plant, you see two instars and two eggs. I have not put a picture of the two eggs, but how would you record this entry? Okay, we're waiting for some answers. You've got- This guy is velvety. The uh, okay. large one is velvety. Okay, we've got some responses. I've got um, two E comma four comma three with a circle around it. Okay. Oh, wait, 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 wait. She changed her mind. Two E comma five comma three with a circle. Mm -hmm. Anybody else before we turn it back over to Rebecca? All righty, it's all you. Okay, so the two eggs are easy. Instead of putting two eggs, which we could easily get confused with a second instar and an egg, we just put E comma E. So if we were to see three eggs, it would be E comma E comma E. And that's one way that we can avoid the confusion with the instar numbers. For the two instars that you see, the largest one, I give you a hint, the skin is a velvety, its tentacles extend quite a distance away from the, the top of its head, and the black stripes are pretty good in size. This actually is a young five, but it is still a fifth instar. So one of the instars is gonna be a fifth. So moving on to this instar over here, let's take a look at those tentacles. The tentacles definitely extend past the head. So this indeed is a four. Okay, so this kind of highlights the size difference. And remember, size is not a really good field um, marking to use for identification. So what would I do? E comma E, four comma five, one big circle around all four of those items to symbolize I saw four things on that one plant. All right, so what do we do with that information? I suggest, or at least it has been my experience, that you go ahead and you take your your data and put it on a separate piece of paper before, in doing this out in the field, before you try to put it into the data sheet. What you have here is the data sheet, okay, for monitoring monarch density. 
plant A, which was our first example, we saw two items or two monarchs on a single plant. So here we would take this information and we would put it into this box right here. For plant B, we only saw one instar or one monarch on the plant. So this four, we would put up here in this box. Over here, we just saw four items, four monarchs on one plant. So we would take this information, EE45, and put it up here, four monarchs per plant. If we also went ahead and took a look at five, six, seven, 10, 15, 20 other milkweed plants, but did not see any monarch larvae, we would go ahead and write that information, let's get the cursor all the way over there, in this box right here. You could either use hash marks or you could just write the total number. At the end, you would total it all up, including your adults, and this is where you would put the dead stages. Okay. This information goes ahead is then entered online via Monarch Larva Monitoring Program's data portal. So it goes online and they store it for you. They also compile it for you. We are currently in our second year of data collection for this program, which is a citizen science project designed to monitor and track, or track monarch egg, larvae, and milkweed abundance throughout North America. We conduct, as I mentioned, the Monarch Density Monitoring, which is act, the Activity 1C, at two registered sites. If you are a frequent Winter Park visitor, these locations may look familiar to you. Here's a picture of our first registered site. This is the gardens. It is a cultivated space and it is not perfect. Notice here that it is not a perfect space. It is less than 500 square feet, so maybe something you might be able to replicate in your own yard. And believe it or not, it has really easy milkweed access. And access not only for the adult monarch to come in and lay eggs, but also for someone like myself to come in and monitor if she's actually laid those eggs. Let's look next at the data from this site. And what I have shown for you right here is the data which comes back from the Monarch Larva Monitoring Project. They go ahead and they put all, they put the data together for you so that there is a consistent uh, format. Um, so it's e easy to compare sites, um, not only if you have multiple sites that you are analyzing, but you can compare your site to a site that's in a different state. Here we're showing the monarch density. The date observed is on the lower axis and the number of monarchs per milkweed is on the left hand side. So you can see our data showed a typical bell curve with a peak at the end of August and then declining in numbers. Our peak number of monarchs per milkweed in 2019 was 2.1. The interesting thing about this data is that only 11% of the eggs and larvae observed were fourth or fifth instars. Let's go ahead and take a look at the current year, 2020. We have fewer weeks that we actually monitored. However, we still exhibit the same, but slightly flattened bell curve. Our number of monarchs per milkweed is down from the two point, I think it was 2.1, down to 1.1. However, the exciting part about this is that 39% of our instars were, were fourth and fifth instars. That's pretty exciting. That means they, they made it a little further down the mortality curve or rate. Let's take a look at our second site. And our second site is actually the Metal Trail. As you can see, it is not a perfect site either. It is a long transect, long and through a sunny field. The monitoring area is over 6,000 square feet. The milkweed is tightly packed with other native plants, many of which are rich nectar sources. It'll be interesting to see over the long run if the data from the two sites are statistically unique. Looking at the data, again, similar bell curve, but lower monarch density than our garden site. The monarch density is just above 
0.25 monarchs per milkweed. And that was in 2019. If you look at 2020, again, beautiful bell-like curve, okay? Very similar to our garden site. Um, so what's so interesting about the field this year is that we had a 2x increase in monarch density. And you'll also notice there's a lot more colors going on here. So we had a huge in, um, increase in diversity. If you look at the previous slide, whoops. If you look at the previous slide, notice all of this light blue. Those were all eggs and very few larvae. But if you look at 2020, look at all these beautiful colors. So all of these represent larva. Okay. So moving on, can we make any conclusions about our sites? No, we cannot. We only have two years of data. But in comparing 2019 to 2020, it does appear that we have higher diversity of monarch larva at both sites. And it's very interesting. I'm curious to see how these compare to other sites locally as well as nationwide. Okay, so you have heard a lot about monarch biology. You've heard how to identify instars as well as perhaps even how to do your own monarch larva monitoring. Now, I'd like to share with you some ways you can help us help the monarchs. Some of those ways include supporting new and existing milkweed habitat, allow it to grow, don't use pesticides or herbicides. Another way, of course, is to get involved in citizen science. Register your own site and monitor or volunteer to join our citizen scientist team. And one more slide, you can still help and support by creating nectar sources for migrating monarchs. Allow those fall blooming natives that so often we consider weeds such as asters and goldenrods to bloom. Plant native wildflowers over tropical alternatives. So now that you've heard just a few of the ways that you can help, how will you do so? How will you help? And we have a quick poll for you. Okay, this poll is up. How will you help monarchs? Um, some, some relatively easy things to do, like planting milkweed, um, telling other people about monarchs, um, becoming a citizen scientist. I have put in the chat the Monarch Larva Monitoring Project link, so copy that down and check it out. Stop using pesticides in my green spaces. Get involved in the project here on your own or allow native wildflowers to grow in my spaces. Here's our results. And back to you, Rebecca. Oh, wonderful. I'm glad to see that we have, uh, we've increased the, the people who want to plant native milkweed. Fabulous, fabulous. All it takes is one plant at a time and we'll get there, we'll get there. So let me go ahead and move on to my next slide. And that really is the end of my presentation. However, I'd like to take a shout out and say thank you to my Warner Park and Nature Center colleagues for their support, to the Warner Park management team and Metro Parks for the opportunity to study monarchs, and of course, to the friends of Warner Parks. This and many other programs would not be possible without their generous support. So thank you very much. Okay, don't go anywhere because we have questions posed by the audience. So what if we do three minutes of question time and then we'll wrap this up. Don't forget that we have been recording this and all of the attendees, including those people who were not attendees but did sign up, will receive this. Um, we have a question. How do you identify an adult monarch butterfly? Okay, well, a dog. Adult monarch butterflies are going to be in the brushfoot family. And if you're familiar with those, um, they are medium sized butterflies that only have four visible legs. The, uh, the second set of legs are held really super tightly up and are used more as sensory organs. Um, so 
if you have the ability to take a look at it and confirm that it has four legs, you know you've got a butterfly in the brushfoot family, then take a look at the orange and black patterns. If both the, um, if the patterns kind of radiate out from the body without an additional horizontal line on the lower hind wing, then you have a monarch and not a viceroy, which is a, a copycat. Um, but there are several field guides um, that uh, we could um, perhaps provide uh, links to at another time, or um, now I'm not sure if Heather can do that, but there are several really good field guides, including one put out by Rita Venerable that shows the exact field markings for monarchs in comparison to other butterflies in the brushfoot uh, family. Do we have another question, Heather? Yes, we do. I was writing Rita Venable's name in the chat in her book, Butterflies of Tennessee. Now, Thank you. This, this question is kind of dangerous as a homeowner. So okay. Someone has asked, how do you start growing milkweed? <laughs> oh, well, that's a good question, but I, I actually do have a pretty good suggestion for you. Now is actually one of the best times to start uh, your, your vision for your milkweed um, plot is in the fall. So find a, a spot somewhere in your yard, which you're okay with putting milkweed, and um, you can kind of see because it's always fun to watch the, uh, the butterflies uh, come when it's in bloom, as well as to monitor uh, the, the larva. But make sure you've got sun with access perhaps to a little bit of moisture. Um, if you have um, a complete rocky soil with very low moisture retaining uh, capabilities, you might wanna look somewhere else in your yard to see if you've got a little bit of, of soil that can hold a little bit more moisture. Go ahead and put, put the leaves that are falling now, put them down on that space, take a tarp, put that on top of your leaves, and leave it there all winter. That'll go ahead and um, die, allow the grass to die out, and then on top of that, um, or allow the grass to die, and then at the end of the season in the spring, go ahead and remove the tarp, and go ahead and remove any of the stuff that is there. And then hopefully you've got a nice little spot that's been pre-cleared for your seedlings of milkweed, which you can go to several native landscape stores that we have here in Nashville and get small seedlings and go ahead and plug them in. So it's actually a great time to go ahead and start um, thinking about where you might want to plant your milkweed. And it's actually not that hard um, as we think it is. So give it a try. Thank you again, Rebecca, for being here. Rachel Anderson, thank you for monitoring the phones and the Q&A tonight and taking care of our tech support. The next Find Your Internationalist program will focus on autumn trees of Warner Park on Tuesday, November 10th, and Vera Roberts will be our presenter. I look forward to seeing you all then. Have a good evening, and thank you again for supporting the park.